Good morning. morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. People came from far away saying, Jesus told them that his hour had come, that the grain of wheat must die before it could bear fruit. We too can find life by giving ourselves. He said, whoever serves me must follow me. The opening hymn is throughout these Lenten days and nights. Eternity. 
Now please join me in our prayer of confession from Psalm 51. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, erase our wrongdoing. Wash us thoroughly from our, our offenses and cleanse us from our sin. For we know that our errors and our sins are ever before us. Against you and you alone we have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You are justified in your sins against us and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, we were born guilty, self-seeking from the beginning when our mothers conceived us. You desire truth in our inward being. Therefore, teach us wisdom in our hearts. Purge us with hyssop, and we shall be clean. Wash us, and we shall be whiter than snow. Let us hear the glad Let us rejoice. Hide your face from our sins, and blot out all our atrociousness. Create in us clean hearts, O God and put a new and right spirit within us. Do not cast us away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain in us a willing spirit tongues will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths will declare your praise. Hear these words of assurance. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hear these words of assurance. Hear these words of assurance from the ending of Psalm 51. A sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Heart God will not despise. Friends, believe the good news in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. So at this time, would you please stand and pass the peace to everyone? Peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you here. Please be seated. So I don't think we have any children here this morning, but there may be some children on the Zoom call. And so the children's message this morning is, um, last week I talked about the caterpillar and I showed the picture of this pet caterpillar that I have and how it was getting larger and how it went into its cocoon. And so what I ask the kids at the first service, and what I'll ask any children that may be watching on Zoom, is um, how long do you think the lifespan of a caterpillar is? So from the time that it hatches out of its tiny egg and grows as a caterpillar and then becomes um, a butterfly, comes out of its cocoon, and then becomes a butterfly and then dies as an adult butterfly, what is the lifespan? And the answer is 12 weeks, depending on the breed of butterfly, 12 weeks. Now, the next question I had for the children was, how long does the butterfly stay in the cocoon? And the answer is two weeks. So two weeks of 12, that's like 17% of that thing's life, is spent trapped inside a cocoon. And I can imagine, so in people terms, that would be like 12 years. Imagine for 12 years just being caught inside of a cocoon. And I imagine that if I were caught inside of a cocoon, I would, feel, I would feel pretty sad. I'd feel like, I don't even know what's going through this caterpillar's mind, but when is this going to end? When am I going to get out of this thing? Kind of like we felt during COVID, maybe. And um, then I asked the kids um, if they had ever felt sad. And I, so let, let me just ask you, have you ever felt sad? Raise your hand if you've felt sad. We've all felt sad at some point. And then... Um, I said I wanted to teach them a, a scripture, and this is, from, this is from the Psalms, chapter 30, verse 5. 
And it says, it says, you may feel, you may be weeping, you may feel like crying, even through the night, but in the morning comes joy. So no matter how, no matter how sad you feel, there will be another period of joy coming. And that's true with the caterpillars too. And then I, then I said, and I'll just ask you, guess what happened to the uh, cocoon, because I had this, the caterpillar went into the cocoon, it was there for two weeks. Guess what happened this week? Yep, I have a butterfly now. It came out of its cocoon. And I've got the butterfly right here. This poor thing has been trapped for the last two hours in this jar, but here it is. I showed the children. Actually, there was one family where the kids are afraid of butterflies, so I almost terrorized them with this. I was sorry about that, but there's the butterfly. And uh, I actually had, had let um, 12 uh, caterpillars form chrysalis, and uh, 12 butterflies uh, came out of their cocoons this week. And that's in the butterfly. There's a little butterfly display house in the, um, in the uh, fellowship hall. So the children in between the services went into the little butterfly house, and they got to see the butterflies uh, fluttering around. So let's say a prayer. God, there are times when we feel sad and we remember this verse from Psalm 30, chapter 5, from Psalm chapter 30, verse 5, that our crying may last all night, but in the morning will come joy. No matter what it is we're going through, no matter how sad we may be, there will be another period of joy coming, just like the butterfly eventually comes out of the cocoon. So God, we give you thanks for this word of encouragement. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the hymn, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed.
have a few announcements this morning. Another sign of life in this church, new life, is we have hired a new director of pastoral care, and her name is Reverend Melody Meter. Melody will be starting on May 1st. She has a lot of experience in uh, hospice care and end-of-life care, and in, um, she served as a hospital chaplain um, for several years in a network of hospitals in Brooklyn. She's an ordained minister in the Reformed Church, and uh, she's been attending worship here from time to time over the past few months. So like I said, she'll start on May 1st, and she'll be uh, doing liturgy um, in the next uh, couple of weeks, so you'll get to, uh, to meet her as she's leading liturgy from the pulpit, and at some point we'll also have her, have her preach. But we're very excited that she will be beginning on a very part-time basis, 10 hours a week, but she'll be available for pastoral care which she's very gifted at. She'll also be um, restarting the Stephen Ministers program, and she'll be in charge of that. Um, I talked last week about the Easter challenge. We have a very generous donor who has given us um, a challenge grant, and the way it works is that if 70 of us, 70 members and friends of Hopewell, give a gift to this, then this person will give uh, a one-to-one match, dollar-for-dollar match, up to $10,000. So that's the way the Easter challenge will work. And so far, we have 27 people who've given gifts. I just sent out a letter this week to the congregation so with a return envelope. So most likely, we'll be getting more gifts in over the next couple of weeks, and hopefully, we'll reach that 70 mark. If you haven't given your gift yet, we uh, invite you to be one of those people that's counted among the 70 that give to this challenge. I've talked to a lot of people that are having trouble with um, getting their vaccine appointment. Many of you know how frustrating that is. You know, you have to go on the website or you have to call, make phone calls, and it's just, it's very difficult. People will spend sometimes hours on the, on the internet trying to get an appointment. So if you haven't yet been able to get your appointment for a vaccine, let us know, um, because we're starting a new program which will be led by Sue Nieves. We'll be recruiting a group of volunteers, and those volunteers will be, on your behalf, will be doing the search for you. So all you have to do is give them your your basic information, and they will try to get, the, and then you also give them your appointments, the times you might be available, and they will do the work for you of trying to get you your appointment. So we're going to try to help each other out here so that we can all get vaccinated. Um, so you can call Birgit in the church office to let her know that you would be interested in receiving that kind of help to get your, vac- your vaccine. There will be an Easter caroling happening. We've changed the date. It will now happen next week on Palm Sunday. I can't believe next week's Palm Sunday. How did that happen? Where does the, where does the time go? But next week is Palm Sunday. So we'll meet at 1.30 in the parking lot, and we'll be um, singing carols to uh, people who are, who are shut in at home, and they'll be receiving the joy of some music. I just wanted to quickly review with you the... Um, Holy Week services. So next week, Palm Sunday, we'll have the regular services at 8.30 and 10.45. And then on Monday, Thursday, we'll have uh, a 7 p.m. service. And that, I, what I'm so encouraged about is we have nine children who will be receiving their first communion. And we've been having the classes during the week on Wednesday nights or Wednesday uh, afternoons. And it was just so great to see the uh, nine children going through that class. Um, and I mean, for me, that's great because Since I've been here, you know, we haven't had many children involved. I know in the past you've had many more than nine children, but um, to me that's an encouraging sign. Um, Then on Good Friday, we'll have a prayer vigil here from noon to 3 p.m. and a worship service at 7 p.m. on Good Friday. And then on Easter, we have our our service begins with the sunrise service at 6.30, which will be out by the vault in the parking lot. And then we will have uh, the two Easter services, 8.30 and 10.45. Let us continue our worship of God with our tithes and offerings. And the, uh, the song is, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross by Stephen Nielsen.
Hear our offertory prayer. Dear God, these are gifts for you, gifts that will be spent to teach each other in your church and to teach those far away about you. Bless these gifts and help us to use them to grow in love for each other, maintaining a space of hospitality in this building and reaching outside our doors to those who need our support so they in turn can share their gifts. Teach us to give good gifts. You are the giver of all gifts, the gifts of our lives, the gift of our redeeming, and the gift of eternal life. We thank you for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. So there are a few joys and concerns this morning as we go to God in prayer. And one joy is that we've been praying for Lynette, um, Lynette G., who's been struggling with COVID. And the good news is that Lynette is, it looks like she's kind of uh, out of the woods maybe. She's really doing much better and has recovered. So thank you for your prayers for Lynette. We also want to ask you to continue to pray for John Young and Ginny Young, who both have COVID. John has been released from the hospital, uh, but he is really not doing well. So he needs, uh, we really need, to, need you to pray for both of them. Um, it, it appears that John's neurological system has been somehow affected by COVID. Uh, we're not sure exactly what that means yet. And, um, and Ginny's very sick, so please, uh, she, she went in for an infusion this week, so she's uh, starting to do better after the infusion of antibodies. But please pray for both John and Ginny for their full recovery. Um, please continue to pray, pray for Vaughn, Arlene uh, Soprenant's husband, who was taken to the hospital last week after a fall. He's now home from the hospital and recovering and, and doing better, but please continue to pray for him. And are there any other um, prayer requests this morning? My daughter-in-law that had the heart attack last week is very, very weak, so my son's taken two weeks of his sick leave to stay home and help her. He said she can't be alone. So, so continue to pray for your daughter-in-law. Sandy. Sandy, okay. Okay. So prayers for your sister also to find assisted living. Jan. Uh, Pastor Steve Denver's mom was hospitalized this week following a seizure. Oh, no. Okay. Steve Denver's mother. Please pray for his, his mother who just had a seizure this week. Any other joys or concerns? Okay, let us pray. God, we ask that you would care for these concerns that we've raised to you, that we've spoken here. We pray for Ginny and John. Pray that John would be fully healed and recover fully from COVID. We pray for Ginny that she would also fully recover, that you'd Keep them in your care, God. We pray for Judy's daughter-in-law, Sandy, that you'd continue to strengthen her as she recovers. We pray for her sister, Judy's sister, who's looking into finding uh, assisted living. We pray that you would help her in that search, guide her in that search. We pray that something would materialize this week. We pray for Steve Damber's mother, who's, been, uh, who's had a seizure. We pray that you would uh, help her to heal and recover. For all these people struggling with illness, we pray that you'd be a comfort to people deeply in their hearts and minds as they recover. We give thanks also that Lynette has fully, seems fully recovered from COVID, so we thank you for, for her recovery. We give thanks also for the joy of Hans's, uh, his, his daughter's uh, new baby, he now has uh, two new grandchildren, Olivia and now Daniel was just born. Um, so we give thanks for that new birth. And God, for all of the other concerns that are on our hearts, the anxieties, the, the uh, fears, prayers that we have for other people, we just lift them up to you now in a moment of silence.
Hear our prayer, Lord. We pray for your church and the world, God. We pray for the nations of the world that are all struggling, continuing to struggle with this virus. We pray for you to give people perseverance. We pray for any place that's experiencing political unrest or civil unrest. We pray for your peace to come, a peace which the world cannot give or take away. It's the peace that comes from you. We pray that you'd spread your peace across this, this world. And now we pray together, God, the prayer that Jesus taught us. And if we listen to every word of this prayer, it will soften us and it will train us in humility. It will open us. So we think of every word as we pray this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now please join me in the prayer for illumination as we go to God's word. Let us sing together our prayer for illumination this morning. Scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 26. Now, this is a passage where Jesus has just told his disciples that he's about to go to the cross. And this follows that passage. It's also the middle of the Passover festival. You'll hear in this passage where it says they're going up to worship at the festival. The festival they're talking about is the Passover. And so this is literally. Um, days, maybe one or two days before Jesus uh, ends up getting arrested and uh, tried and crucified. So this is among his last teachings. Hear the word of God. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival, some were Greeks. They came to Philip, who is from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Here ends the reading of God's word for us this morning. May God help us as we seek to understand these words. So I want to focus this morning on... This passage where Jesus says, he teaches kind of one of these final teachings, and he says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And then he says, those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it.
for eternal life. It sounds like a paradox. And Jesus so often taught in these paradoxes that are kind of perplexing to us. In order to be first, you must be last. In order to be the greatest of all, you must be the servant, the lowest of all. In order to be rich, you must sell all your possessions, give your money to the poor, and follow me. In order to find life, you must die to life. What is he talking about? Sacrifice is the salvation of life. But selfishness is the stagnation of life. Jesus gives us this teaching just after announcing his approaching death on the cross. The cross is the way to sacrifice, the way to life. And the degree to which we are able to sacrifice ourselves, the degree is the degree that we will experience the liberation and the life that is available. Now, Jesus doesn't mean you should hate the life that God has given you. He doesn't literally mean that we should hate our lives, but he means that we must give this life away, we must offer it, and use it for the benefit of others and for God. We must give this life away with generous abandon. Give your life away, Jesus says, and you will find it. Surrender your life, and you will gain it. So I've been trying to understand these words this week as I've been preparing the sermon, and I was thinking about all of the times over the, the last um, roughly 20 years that I've been an ordained pastor that I've had the privilege of sitting with someone as they die, holding their hand as they're going through those last breaths, and the breaths become kind of further and further apart. And what happens in almost every case is that there is, there's a kind of surrender that happens. And you can't, you can't help it when you're on your deathbed, when you're facing death. Um, you can't help but to let go. And when I see that happen, you see this kind of glow come over a person. You see a serenity and a peace. And you, you see that people just become calm. And there's just sort of a beautiful serenity. And it's a beautiful moment to be able to share with someone that sacred moment of death. And I sometimes wish that we could all experience that joy of surrendering before we get to that moment of death. Joan Walsh Anglin said, with release comes peace. Let me learn to love without holding on, to give without expecting to receive in return. Jesus said, anyone who loves their life will lose it. But anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it forever. Anyone who hangs on to this life will lose it. But anyone who is willing to surrender and let it go will actually find it. But how do we have the courage to do that, just to let go? I was talking with Betsy DeSoma here after church last Sunday. And Betsy, I don't remember the exact author of the quote, but you had a beautiful quote last Sunday that you told me, and I want to share it with everyone, if that's okay. And I don't remember the author, but this quote was, um, for anyone who's feeling that surrendering to Jesus is too daunting, and the quote is, surrender as much of your life as you can to as much of Jesus as you can surrender, or as much of Jesus as you understand. So surrender as much of your life as you're able to to as much of Jesus as as you can understand. And who is the author of that? Samuel Shoemaker. Samuel Shoemaker. It's a beautiful quote. But it was hard even for Jesus to give up his life, to surrender. The last time that I was in Jerusalem, it was before the pandemic, I used to travel there often because I was working on a peace process with the church leaders there. And this was after a long day of meetings and it was at dusk, and I went up to the village of Gethsemane 
just past the Mount of Olives, which is on a hill overlooking the old city of Jerusalem. And I just sat there in this serene spot, and I looked down at the old city. You could see the whole old city of Jerusalem there with the old walls of the city circumnavigating the city. And it was such a beautiful sight to look at the old city of Jerusalem, to think this, this was exactly the view that Jesus would have seen. Because it says in the Bible that in his last week of life, Jesus slept every night in Gethsemane. He'd go up to that village where I was, that hill on the Mount of Olives, and he would sleep at night. And then in the morning, he would come down and he would enter through the Eastern Gate, which is called the Golden Gate. It's not actually golden, it's made of stone, but it's got these two arches. And he would go through that gate and he would teach in the temple. And you can see the Temple Mount right there from that view. He would teach in the temple and hordes of people would come to hear him teach. Now that was to fulfill a prophecy because there's a prophecy in the Bible that says the Messiah, when the Messiah comes, will enter through the Eastern Gate. That's the gate that the Messiah will enter through. That was the gate that Jesus went into. And it was so beautiful to sit up there on the Mount of Olives at this serene dusk, you know, and to see that gate and to imagine, I might have been sitting right in the spot where Jesus was when he surrendered himself to God. And that passage is in the Gospel of Mark. It's where Jesus says he was with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, and he fell to the ground on his knees, and he prayed, God, if it's possible, let this hour pass from me. Abba, Father, he cried, everything is possible for you. And so I know it's possible. Take this cup away from me. Take it away from me. But not what I will, but what you will. Not my will be done, but your will be done. So even Jesus didn't want to surrender himself to God. He put it in God's hands, though. And as soon as he did, he was arrested. He was tried. He went to the cross to be crucified. But we know the story doesn't end there. He was also resurrected and brought life to the world. His decision to surrender led to an unleashing of life for all humanity through all time. And the point is that we are still receiving life from that decision 2,021 years later. Jesus said, truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. He was talking about the death that he would die for our sakes on the cross. But he was also talking about an invitation for us to live the same way. He said, if you try to hold on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you're willing to surrender it, to let it go, you'll find life. Tim Keller is the former pastor of the Presbyterian, Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, and he said, nothing makes you more miserable than self-absorption. How am I feeling? How am I doing? Do other people approve of me? How are people treating me? Am I succeeding? Am I failing? Am I being treated justly? There's nothing more psychologically disintegrating, nothing more socially distancing than self-absorption. Self-absorption makes you absolutely miserable. It's why nations go to war. It's why families break apart because of self-absorption. Keller said, we've chosen to be our own kings and lords. Self-centeredness has destroyed us. When we decided to become our own kings and lords, that's when everything started to fall apart in our lives. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus is the true king, the true Lord of our lives. And when we allow Jesus to be the king, to be the Lord of our lives, what we'll notice is that everything, maybe not instantly, but everything will begin to heal Everything will begin to fall in line again. Fear will be gone. Anxiety will be gone. Love will begin to flow back into your life, and you begin to experience the fullness of life that Jesus is talking about here. Serving Jesus. Resembling Jesus. Pleasing Jesus. Knowing Jesus must become the supreme passion of our lives. Everything else is secondary. Tim Keller said, you will be dead so long as you refuse to die to yourself. Jesus asks us to be willing to give everything up to follow him, and he promises us life when we do. 
A few years ago, I heard a story of a man who was feeling agitated and angry, and so he went for a walk in New York City. He went up to Inwood Park. He was walking through Inwood Park, and if you've ever been to Inwood Park, there's a museum there called the Cloisters. It's part of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He went into the Cloisters, and inside the Cloisters, he found a replica of Michelangelo's Pieta. You've probably seen it before. I'll show you a picture of it. The Pieta is this beautiful sculpture of Mary holding the body of Jesus. Let's see if we can find the picture here. There's the picture of the Pieta. And what's beautiful about this is it's a reflection of the nativity, of when Mary was holding the baby Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes, only here she's holding the dead body of Jesus that's just been taken down from the cross. And as he stood and he looked at the Pieta, he tried something. He took his coat and he put it in his arms and he was trying to, he was trying to mimic the way that Mary's holding Jesus here. And as he tried to mimic the way that she's holding Jesus, his coat just kept falling out of his hands because he couldn't quite get the positioning right. And then he realized something. Mary's not holding on to Jesus at all. If you look at the way Mary's hands are grasped and positioned, She's letting Jesus go. She's surrendering Jesus. She's giving him to us. And in that moment, he realized there was something he needed to give away, to surrender to God. His agitation, his anger, he started lifting it up, releasing it, giving it away, and he began to feel slowly a joy returning to his life. What is it that you need to surrender? What are you holding on to? Maybe it's bitterness. Let go of the bitterness so God can replace it with love. Maybe it's anger. Let go of the anger so God can replace it with peace. Maybe it's dreams or plans that never turned out the way you wanted to, or it's some sort of an illness or something that you're hanging on to. Jeremiah chapter 20, 29 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So whatever it is, let go of it, surrender it. Maybe it's fear. Surrender it. It says in 2 Timothy for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Maybe it's your past that you need to surrender over. That's true with us personally. That's also true with us as a church. We need to give away the past. The past is not coming back. We've got a future in this church, and it's not going to look like the past. Let go of it and fall back into the powerful and loving arms of God who says, rest. Rest like the psalmist who wrote, I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child within its mother's arms. Like a weaned child, my soul within me is at rest. Or let go like Paul who said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. God loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus says, those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Living the way of Jesus, surrendering yourself to him, it is one of the easiest things to do, but it is also one of the hardest things to do. It's one of the easiest things to do because you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is just, just open your arms. Let God have it. And it's one of the hardest things to do because we don't want it. We, we want to hang on. We want to control. I found this poem about letting go on the Internet, and it's not a profound poem. It's not a well-written poem, 
but I think it makes the point. It's called Broken Dreams. As children bring their broken toys with tears for us to mend, I brought my broken dreams to God because God was my friend. But then instead of leaving my dreams to God in peace to work alone, I hung around and tried to help with ways that were my own. At last, I snatched my dreams back and I cried, God, how could you be so slow? My child, God said, what could I do? You never did let go. Let go of your dreams. Let go of your problems. Surrender them to God. And trust that God will do a better job with your life than we could possibly do on our own. Let us pray. God, give us the strength to surrender. Give us the ability to trust in you enough to surrender all of the things that we're holding on to, all of the wrong things that we're holding on to. Give us the insight to see what it is that we need to give back to you. Our very lives help us to give as much of our lives over to you, to as much of you as we can understand. Letting go is so hard, and yet life would be so much simpler so much more effortless if we could do it. So help us, God, to surrender and to enjoy the peace and the joy and the rest that will meet us when we do. Amen. The closing hymn is Christ whose glory fills the skies. Give over your life to Christ. Trust Christ with your life. Discern what is it that I need to give and give it over. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds and the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ our Lord, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>